And I would like to move us along now to uh, a feast of another sort, an uh, intellectual feast, a spiritual feast, with the portion of our program that focuses on uh, tributes to Dr. von Hildebrand. Uh, I think there is no uh, more terrific testimony to the difference that a teacher makes in a student's life than to hear from that student many years later after uh, the student has left the, the teacher's care. Uh, so we'll begin tonight's program uh, with remarks from Stephanie Block, a student of Dr. von Hildebrand's 40 years ago at Hunter College, uh, a convert to Catholicism, uh, married to another convert to Catholicism, and uh, I'll leave it to Stephanie to fill in the rest of her terrific story, but uh, this is the beginning of our, uh, our celebration of Dr. von Hildebrand, so please welcome uh, Stephanie Block. I'm sure that many of you know that in addition to her many published works, that Lily Alice von Hildebrand also has many unpublished works. And among them um, are some memoirs of her teaching career at Hunter College. In them she writes, I discovered that not only were the majority of my students allergic to the words such as truth and moral values, but that they were definitely on the far left of the political spectrum. I recall that one day speaking about the dignity of a person, I related the episode I had read concerning the Soviet army building a bridge. One of the workers had fallen into the water and the author writes, they had no time to pick up a fallen comrade. They simply walked over him. The story was not well received by my students and I was booed. Several students started shouting this was nothing but fascist propaganda. Well, at least the students were open about their hostility. The professors found all sorts of underhanded ways to harass her, which raises the question, why would somebody remain in such an environment? The answer in Alice's words, where I was convinced that I was doing meaningful work and was equipped to address every possible nationality, every possible sort of philosophical outlook, and every sort of background, particularly the humble and problematic circumstances typical of Hunter College students. There are numerous conversion stories in the Hunter memoirs. One of my favorites, which I've condensed a great deal here, describes a fellow who was uh, pretty typical of the hippie years. She writes, I was teaching a course of metaphysics. I had already started teaching very punctually when a man in his late 20s stepped into the classroom. His hair was long and unwashed. He wore a broad-rimmed hat and his body language expressed despair. The man dragged himself to the last row, collapsed in a chair, and instead of facing me, turned sideways toward the wall. He remained immobile, mute as a sphinx. I was convinced he wasn't listening to me. The sight was not inspiring. This went on for several weeks. One day, I was discussing the hierarchy of substances, and I spoke about the greatness of man, the fact that he has a soul that he's capable of knowing, willing, and loving. To my amazement, the fellow jumped up as if he'd been stung by a hornet and started shouting at me, accusing me of imposing my ideas on others. I was stunned. He had never appeared to pay any attention to what I was saying. During the rest of the semester, however, he never said another word. His final examination was a disaster. I should clearly have given him an F but to my shame, I calculated that if I did so, he might have to take the course over again. <laughs> At any rate, I was convinced that I wouldn't see him again. I was mistaken. The next semester in the spring, he registered for two of my courses. His appearance had not changed, same long hair, same hat, but he was no longer sitting in the last row. 
He selected a seat instead in the middle. He never said a word, but now he faced me rather than the wall, and that was an improvement. The next semester, he took two more courses, sitting in the front row. And then came one of the most amazing days of my life. In the 10 minutes I had between classes, during which I always hoped to have a moment of respite to catch my breath, I found five students standing in front of my office door. He was the first, so I invited him to enter. As soon as I closed the door, he practically jumped on me. And he screamed, I want to go to confession. Please send me to a priest, but you know, a real priest. <laughs> I didn't know what to say. He asked, aren't you a Roman Catholic? Yes, I am. What about you? I used to be, but I lost my faith in the seminary. But you know, last night, I had an overwhelming experience. God exists. He exists, and I want to go to confession. Now, I know a lot of professors, and this is not a typical conversation that they have with their students. But I don't think it was all that unusual for Alice. There is a whole passel of her students from Hunter College who are her godchildren. And for every one of them, dozens, if not hundreds, of other students, all of whom owed so much to her, intellectually and spiritually. Her wit and her generosity were the sugar that made the medicine go down, but the medicine, the truth, the salubrious truth, was her gift to us in a world that's very stingy about it. I don't know how one says thank you for that, Lily, but I can't imagine my life without you. Over the, over the course of its, its life, the Legacy Project has uh, expanded its scope of activities beyond just the United States into Europe. And one of our most stalwart friends and allies in Europe is uh, Christoph Schoenborn, the Cardinal of Vienna, a deputy of his. Uh, my friend Christian Alting van Gessu is here tonight to extend the Cardinal's uh, greetings to us. Thank you very much. Before I read the words of Cardinal Schoenborn, I wanted to make a small remark. Um, lately, I've had the honor to develop an email correspondence with Lily. And I have to say that is a particular joy um, in this way because it shows how far ahead Lily is in the fact that for a 90-year-old woman, it seems to be no problem to be sending back and forth emails. And I know from my own family that that can also be very different. <laughs> so on behalf of Cardinal Schoenborn, I have been asked to present this message to you. At the occasion of Alice von Hildebrand's investiture as Lady Grand Cross of the Order of St. Gregory the Great, and the commemoration of her 90th birthday today, I would like to express my deep gratitude for all Alice has done for the church and for society throughout a life that continues to have all the hallmarks of Christian discipleship and service. In Lady Alice, which is only a most fitting title, the church has a daughter greatly gifted in teaching and writing, whilst she is always ready to defend the truth that can only be found in Jesus Christ, our Savior. In an exemplary way, Lady Alice has also been working on securing the work of her late husband, Dietrich, so that it may bear fruit, much fruit,
for generations to come. May God continue to bless and protect her. Christoph Cardinal Schönborn, Archbishop of Vienna. And on behalf of His Eminence, I would like to present you with a small present, a, a beautiful commemoration of Austria, with whom you have such strong ties, Lily, and it is a, a beautiful set of CDs with chant from the Cistercian Monastery of the Holy Cross. Thank you, Christian. Uh, nomenclature in the Hildebrand Project can become a little confusing. Alice and Lily are in fact the same person, and these names are used interchangeably. So let me ground you in that fact. And then secondly, who is John Crosby? There's John Henry Crosby, who is the founder and executive director of the Hildebrand Project, and a trustee of the project is his father, John F. Crosby, professor of philosophy at Franciscan University at Steubenville. So I invite now John F. Crosby, fellow trustee, to come up uh, for a special toast. Thank, thank you, Duncan. It is indeed um, a great uh, privilege to make the toast to Alice von Hildebrand on this occasion of her birthday. She and I go way back. In just a few years, it will be 50 years since I met her and her husband, the great Dietrich von Hildebrand. But here tonight with this toast, we want to celebrate her 90th birthday. And perhaps we can learn something about celebrating a birthday from her husband. I remember well his last birthday, the last one he celebrated on Earth. It was October the 12th, 1976. I reached him by phone in his hospital room, and I remember vividly the intense, almost passionate gratitude for his life that he expressed to me. I recall in particular him saying, great philosopher as he was, that he had realized on that birthday more than ever before what a gift it was to exist as a person before God. I'll never forget it. No grumbling, no complaining about his life, but this radiant gratitude. Well, this spirit of gratitude is just what we need to celebrate our beloved Lily on her special birthday. And so please know Dear Lily, that we are grateful for being a part of your life, grateful for your maternal love for your many spiritual children, of which Stephanie Bloch is one, grateful for that sharp French wit of yours that has burst many a bubble of self-importance. I speak from experience. <laughs> grateful for your deep Christian wisdom for your courage in the face of adversity, and grateful for your faithfulness to the legacy and mission of your husband. We give thanks for you, Lily, on your birthday. And even though this is your 90th, we still raise the toast, ad multos annos. As you know, Lily prefers to be toasted in Latin. <laughs> now I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming our very honored guest, uh, Raymond Leo Cardinal Burke. He is the prefect of the Supreme Council of the Apostolic Signatura, which is to say the highest judicial body uh, uh, of the Pope. So please join me in welcoming Cardinal Burke, great friend of the Hildebrand Project. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It brings me great joy to be with you tonight to celebrate the 90th birthday of Dr. Alice von Hildebrand, who is a beloved and deeply esteemed friend. With you, I thank God for the gift of life, which through the cooperation of her good parents, he gave to her and has sustained in her for more than 90 years. For Christians, the celebration of the gift of life is inseparably connected with the gift of eternal life received through the sacrament of baptism. In many Christian countries, the gift of life of the individual Christian is not celebrated on the anniversary of natural birth, but on the anniversary of birth in Christ through reception of baptism. Certainly our gratitude for the gift of Lily's life, if I may be so informal uh, in referring to our dear friend and uh, honoree this evening, our gratitude for the gift of her life is inseparably connected with gratitude for her life in Christ, lived with so much integrity and vigor over many years and still today, as she tirelessly gives witness to the truth of the faith through the witness of her life and through her speaking and writing. I think, for instance, of how during her 37 years of teaching at Hunter College, we heard the wonderful testimony tonight of one of her former students, so many students were drawn to Christ and assisted in receiving the gift of faith in him who alone is our salvation. She was a highly competent professor who truly loved her students and therefore wanted them to know the truth at its living source in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In celebrating the birth and baptism of Dr. von Hildebrand, we think immediately of her husband of revered memory, Dr. Dietrich von Hildebrand, to whom she was so devoted, first as his student, and then as his wife and co-worker in the study of the truth taught to us both by faith and reason. And in the life of truth, through love of God, the source of all truth, and the giver of both faith and of reason. How fitting it is that the Dietrich von Hildebrand Leg Legacy Project is the host of our celebration. For since its foundation by John Henry Crosby, Lily has worked tirelessly with him for the realization of its noble purposes. In thanking God for the gift of Alice von Hildebrand to us and to so many whose lives she has transformed by her teaching and her writing, let us join with her in preserving the memory of her beloved husband and in making his important writings, philosophical and theological, available and better known, especially in the English-speaking world. Many of his classical works, for example, What is Philosophy, Ethics, Purity and Virginity, Liturgy and Personality, Transformation and Christ, and The Heart, have been in English translation for years. I recall first encountering them during my secondary school and university years some 45 years ago. They remain as timely today as then and need to be re-edited and published in new editions as has been already accomplished with his work, The Heart. 
There is also a whole corpus of his writing in the original German, especially regarding social and political thought. In his major philosophical treatise, The Metaphysics of Community, which remain untranslated into English and which constitute a secure guide in dealing with so many thorny questions of our time regarding the inviolability of innocent human life, the integrity of marriage and the family, and the freedom of the conscience. In all of these writings, what remained always foremost for Dietrich von Hildebrand was the pursuit of the truth. The Dietrich von Hildebrand project under the direction of John Henry Crosby is dedicated to making better available and known the fruits of Dietrich von Hildebrand's philosophical and theological labors. Ellis von Hildebrand, who gives living and vigorous testimony to those fruits, has spared no labor in fostering and developing the work of the Le Legacy Project. In honoring her tonight, let us rededicate ourselves to the work of the Dietrich von Hildebrand Legacy Project. There is yet another cause for our joy tonight, for Pope Francis in recognition of the outstanding and faithful service of Dr. Alice von Hildebrand to the church and to society in general, has on September 19th of this year, deigned to confer upon her the title of Lady Grand Cross of the Equestrian Order of St. Gregory as a public sign of the esteem in which she is held in the church. Regarding the title of Lady of St. Gregory, Blessed Pope John Paul II, on July 25, 1996, wrote of his great pleasure in conferring the title upon those who, excelling in vigilant genius, have undertaken and brought to completion many works on behalf of society, both Christian and civil. Ellis von Hildebrand's years of teaching and giving public lectures, her many appearances on television and radio programs, her numerous books, articles, and other published writings have all been ultimately directed to the good of souls, their eternal salvation. God has blessed her with many extraordinary gifts of mind and heart. And as his good steward, she has placed them at the service of her brothers and sisters. It must be said that her public exposition of Christ's truth and love is a reflection of countless personal encounters in which she has passionately promoted and defended Christ and his holy church. I am deeply honored to be able to present to Dr. Alice von Hildebrand tonight the diploma which attests to the title with which the Roman Pontiff has chosen to honor her and the insignia which denote it. Pope Gregory XVI, who established the equestrian order, placed the members under the spiritual patronage of Pope Gregory the Great, who is rightly described as a true pastor in the administration of the Universal Church and the Diocese of Rome, the care of the poor, love for the liturgy, and spreading and consolidating of the faith in Rome, Italy, and the world then known. The eight-pointed cross of red enamel with a medallion bearing the image of St. Gregory the Great in the center is the decoration of the order. It represents both the communion of the members with St. Gregory and all of the saints in serving Christ in the world and is a pledge of the intercession of St. Gregory the Great on behalf of the knights and ladies of the order. 
In presenting the diploma and the insignia, which I shall do after these remarks, I thank Dr. Alice von Hildebrand for her exemplary service to the church and ask God to continue to bless her abundantly. Finally, I offer a reflection to honor the life of Dr. Alice von Hildebrand and the memory of her late and renowned husband, Dr. Dietrich von Hildebrand. My reflection is inspired by the address given by Pope Benedict XVI to the Bundestag in Berlin during his pastoral visit to Germany in September of 2011. It seemed especially fitting to offer a reflection inspired by Pope Benedict XVI, who has written so admir admiringly of Dietrich von Hildebrand as a prominent figure in the history of the church, and who received Dr. Ellis von Hildebrand together with John Henry Crosby in private audience to hear about the work of the Dietrich von Hildebrand Legacy Project and to pledge his support of it. So often today, we find individual Catholics as well as Catholic endeavors and institutions in a state of some confusion or even error about their Catholic identity. In particular, a notion of tolerance, of ways of thinking and acting, contrary to Catholic teaching and morals, seemingly has become the interpretative key of many of our Catholic activities. This notion is not securely grounded in the moral tradition, yet it tends to dominate our approach to the extent that we end up claiming to be Catholic while tolerating ways of thinking and acting which are diametrically opposed to the moral law and therefore to the Catholic faith. Our approach becomes so relativistic and subjective that we do not even observe the fundamental logical principle of non-contradiction, that is, that a thing cannot be and not be, cannot both be and not be at the same time. In other words, a Catholic endeavor or institution cannot at the same time be both true to the Catholic faith and not true to the Catholic faith. In fact, charity alone must be the interpretative key of our thoughts and actions. In the context of charity, tolerance means unconditional love of the person who is involved in evil, but firm abhorrence of the evil in which the person is involved. Fundamental to the Catholic life of virtue is the understanding of human nature and conscience. Critical to the deplorable cultural situation in which we find ourselves today is of the loss of a sense of nature and of conscience. Pope Benedict XVI addressed the situation with respect to the foundations of law in the just mentioned address to the Bundestag. Taking leave from the story of the young King Solomon on his accession to the throne, he recalled to political leaders the teaching of the Holy Scriptures regarding the work of politics. God asked King Solomon what request he wished to make as he began to rule God's holy people. The Holy Father commented, what will the young ruler ask for at this important moment? Success, wealth, long life, destruction of his enemies? He chooses none of these. Instead, he asks for a listening heart so that he may govern God's people and discern between good and evil. 
The story of King Solomon, as Pope Benedict XVI observed, teaches what must be the end of political activity and therefore of government. He declared politics must be a striving for justice, and hence it has to establish the fundamental preconditions for peace, to serve right and to fight against the dominion of wrong is and remains the fundamental task of the politician. Pope well, Benedict XVI then asked how we know the good and right which the political order and specifically the law are to safeguard and promote. While he, had igno while he acknowledged that in many matters the support of the majority can serve as a sufficient criterion. He observed that such a principle is not sufficient for the fundamental issues of law in which the dignity of man and of humanity is at stake. Regarding the very foundations of the law of, of, of the life of society, Positive civil law must respect nature and reason as the true sources of law. In other words, one must have recourse to the natural moral law which God has inscribed upon every human heart. Referring to a text of St. Paul's letter to the Romans regarding the natural moral law and its primary witness, the conscience, Pope Benedict XVI declared, here we see the two fundamental concepts of nature and conscience, where conscience is nothing other than Solomon's listening heart, reason that is open to the language of being. Further illustrating the sources of law in nature and reason, by making reference to the popular interest in ecology as a means of respecting nature, he observed. Yet I would like to underline a point that seems to me to be neglected today as in the past. There is also an ecology of man. Man, too, has a nature that he must respect and that he cannot manipulate at will. Man is not merely self-creating freedom. Man does not create himself. He is intellect and will, but he is also nature, and his will is rightly ordered if he respects nature, listens to it, and accepts himself for who he is as one who did not create himself. In this way, and in no other, is true human freedom fulfilled. Reflecting upon European culture which developed from the encounter between Jerusalem, Athens, and Rome, from Israel's faith in God, the philosophical reason of the Greeks, and Roman legal thought, he concluded, in the awareness of man's responsibility before God, and in the acknowledgement of the inviolable dignity of every single human person, European culture has established criteria of law. It is these criteria that we are called to defend at this moment in our history. While well, Pope Benedict XVI's reflection is inspired by a concern for the state of law in the European culture, his conclusions regarding the foundations of law and therefore of order in society are clearly universal in application. What Pope Benedict XVI observed regarding the foundations of law and the concepts of nature and conscience points to the fundamental work of education, namely to develop in students a listening heart, 
which strives to know the law of God and to respect it by development in the life of the virtues. It is to such teaching that Dietrich von Hildebrand dedicated his life with fidelity, generosity, and sincerest love of God and neighbor. To such teaching, in the same Christ-like manner, his devoted wife, Alice, dedicates her life. May they both continue to teach us, leading us forth to know, love, and serve God by a good and holy life, and thus to be a blessing to our neighbor and to our world. Dearest Alice, Lily, in the name of all present, I extend to you our heartfelt best wishes and assure you of our prayers for your intentions. May God continue to bless you abundantly as you strive to serve him with all your heart. May God bless you and grant you more years. And at this time, I would like to present to Dr. Alice von Hildebrand the diploma testifying to her, the conferral of the title of Lady Grand Cross of the Order of St. Gregory the Great, and at the same time to place upon her the insignia of the order. I have faced good many difficult situations in my life, which surprised no one, being given the fact that I'm so old. <laughs> but this one is probably the most difficult, because how am I going to find words to thank His Eminence, to thank the Pope, and all you, my friends, express my gratitude. John Henry generously gives me 10 minutes I hope he has no Swiss watch, because I'm very tempted not to obey him. <laughs> One of the very beautiful things that my husband said to me, not long before his death, do you know what the key to happiness is? Gratitude. So I would like to say a few words about this virtue, which is so crucial in life, and so little practice today. It is basically a response to the goodness of another person, primarily the goodness of God. We should wake up in the morning thanking God for existing, for his existence, for existing, and for our faith. We should also thank him for all the gifts that he places on our lives. Let me mention some that I've received because truly I have been blessed. It seems to me that a very special space belongs to my husband. 
I came to the United States, and for about 30 months, I lived a very, very wintry time. I'm not going to go into reasons, but it was very difficult. And then through God's grace, on the 27th of November, 1932, I was invited to attend his talk in his very, very modest apartment in New York, very close to Harlem. The moment that he spoke, and the theme was transformation in Christ, something happened to me. All of a sudden, I was so captivated by his work. I was so captivated by the other with which he spoke that I made the discovery of what philosophy is. I had had two years in Belgium, and I was very impressed by its clarity, but I never convinced myself to major in philosophy. And when I left this apartment in a state of euphoria, as I've rarely known in my life, I knew I was going to devote my life to it. The topic was transformation in Christ, which is his masterpiece, religiously speaking. I didn't know a single word of German, and I knew that the book had not been translated. And I set myself upon studying the language exclusively because I wanted to read the book. And this book has had an absolutely crucial influence in my life. What was so impressive about his delivery was that he shows that philosophy is not an abstract discipline. It is life. It involves my heart. It involves my intelligence and my will, and therefore opens up a vista of greatness and beauty that most of us are not aware of. That is one one of the greatest gifts of my life, and it deserves that I should mention it, because my whole work in Hunter, all my writings, whatever I have done, is something that I owe to him. Why? Because he showed to me that what we call Christian philosophy is not an abstraction. It is simply reason baptized by faith. Let me tell you very explicitly, quoting Chesterton, the worst criminals are intellectuals. They're not thieves. They're not bigamists. They're people who distort the very essence of education by infecting the poison of relativism or empiricism or whatever it might be. And therefore, this is where the enemy lies, and this is one of the greatest missions in life, is to re-educate our children and give them the, poor, the pure word of truth. His reason was powerful. Already at the age of 14, he pinned his father and five sisters to the wall, who claimed that everything was relative, and he had the first last word. But when he converted, he realized the limitations of human reasons. It is powerful, and yet it is limited. And I can say the greatest about this work is that he learned that only through faith can reason be properly humbled and find an answer to many questions that otherwise you seek in vain. Therefore, to him, I owe my first great thank you. There are two people in this place to whom my spiritual debt is also immense. His Eminence, Cardinal Burke, that I had the privilege of meeting a few years ago. For him to know him has been also a spiritual awakening, because to meet a prince of the church who lives his faith, who expresses his love and other for the Redeemer, the one who loves his sheep and is constantly alerting us that the wolf never sleeps. He's so conscious 
of the greatness of faith and the beauty of faith and simultaneously the dangers that we face today. Let us thank God for priests and priests of the church who know how dangerous the situation is today, how dangerous to fall asleep, how dangerous to swallow the lies that are spread all over relativism in whatever it might be. He is the true pastor. And once again, his daughter, it seems, is immense. This is another one who, for the last 25 years, has been my guide and my help, Father Benedict Rochelle, who, in spite of his weak health, had the kindness of God into mine. And I would like to express my gratitude, an immense gratitude for what he has given me and the guidance that he has constantly offered. Then it seems to me that I should also mention a young man of the name of John Henry Crosby, who, with the daring and innocent optimism of youth, started an organization having no experience and not a cent of money. And he discovered my husband primarily through his aesthetic writings. A very talented violinist, he had given the career because he developed problems in his shoulder. And instead of being defeated, he immediately looked for another thing for which he did devote his life. Frankly, I was a little bit hesitant about giving him permission to do so. As I said, 24 years old, no experience and no money. But there's one thing that he's taught us, that when you love and you have a great intelligence and you put it at the service of truth, you succeed. But obviously, he could never have achieved the success that he has achieved and which reunites us tonight, except through prayers and to the incredible generosity that are some people in this room who have supported the project, helping so generously. I do not know whether they were, I would like me to mention their names, but I would like to express my immense gratitude for the work that they have done. Then comes, of course, innumerable friends. There are so many of you that are my friends, that have the privilege of calling my friends. I cannot possibly quote them all. My husband said, towards the end of his life, you know, love and happiness, no, excuse me, love and friendship are remnants of the earthly paradise. And he's right. You know, in this veil of tears, when we encounter so many difficulties, to have people that you can call a friend is such a joy, is such a comfort, is such a gift. And I'm happy to tell you, I don't know all of you, but all of you became my friend by coming tonight. But those that I know, I thank God for having met them. I thank God for the kindness and generosity. Among them, there is one queen, and the queen is someone that had the blessing of meeting when both of us were in the early 20s, which is a long, long time ago, and whose friendship and generosity and kindness is such that she deserves to be mentioned, Madeleine Stebbins. So, I I said, maybe I should mention a hundred, but we have no time for that. Friendship is, as I said, a remnant for paradise, because we are meant to be united by a bond of love. And friendship implies that you have a clear vision of what the other person is called to be. You see all this person's weaknesses, imperfections. You're always willing to forgive them. I have a strong inkling that Aristotle met her. He would have improved considerably his book on ethics in his Nicomachean Ethics. Quite apart from the tragedy of Aristotle that he leaves out God, it seems to me that he had seen what a Christian friendship can be like. He would certainly have had insights that were unavailable to a pagan. I repeat, 
What is so remarkable about my husband's message is that he lets, let his reason be baptized by humility. He's not a theologian. He never claimed to be one. But he was, was convinced of the power and greatness of human reason and always confronted his findings with the teaching of the faith. Shortly before his death, when he solemnly confided his huge literary bequest, and I say that it is huge because I believe that about 70% of it hasn't yet been translated or published. And he turned to me and he said, I give it to you, I confide it to you, but you must promise that you find a single sentence in my writings which is not in full conformity with the teaching of the church, tear it to pieces. This is what it means to be a Catholic philosopher. His love for reason, his consciousness that reason is great and limited, and his passion for truth. At one point, he realized that his heart was giving in. He loved life, and like all of us, he feared death. He was attached to life. He considered it to be a tremendous gift, but at one point, he knew he was going to be called. And this is the moment that he chose to write, in two weeks, a short booklet on gratitude, shortly followed by another one, a meditation on death, this fearful punishment of original sin. And why fearful? Because God created man with a soul and a body so closely tied together that the body has influence on the soul and the soul has influence on the body. And if you deny this, you're going to be rightly accused of dualism which to many people is simply diabolical. It is true indeed, we are body and soul, but the punishment for original sin was so fearful that God decided to punish it by death. And what is death? That the total closely knit union between body and soul is torn. And this is why dying is so terrible. On the other hand, we have an immortal soul. Now, the very moment that soul and body are separated, which is going to happen to all of us, and to me possibly very soon, and all that is left of your body is dust and ashes, and your soul is facing God and receiving eternal judgment. This is dualism. A fearful dualism, and this is why dying is so fearful, and this is why the Catholic dogma of the resurrection of the body is something so magnificent. To imagine your body and soul severed more for thousands of years. Where is Adam's body today? Where is Eve? And the very same body will rise from the dead and be reunited. That is God's greatness. The last three months of his life, he was constantly meditating on death. He was a communicant, daily communicant, from the day of his baptism, on the 11th of April 14. Never visited. But the last three months of his life, he could never go to Mass. I managed to have him people bring communion as often as possible. And a few hours before his death, he had the blessing of having a priest friend brought him calling communion. He was a strange mixture of Italian and German. His personality was very Italian, and his man was very German. All that I did in my career was simply to transmit his message as faithfully as I do we sometimes seasoned by French wit, which is something that, as a German, he did not possess. <laughs> at any rate, at any rate, one thing is certain. He received Holy Communion, and then he prayed 
anima Christi, a prayer that he had paid his life like on, and which he loved very particularly. And I never, never forget, I was kneeling and respect, when he came to the words, you be me venirati, command me to come to you. And he said so with an intensity and an ardor that brought tears to my eyes. A few hours later, this was practically his last word. A few hours later, God called him. No, it is my hope and wish that when I'm dying, which might be very close, I will also say to God, imitating, you be me veniriate. And this is a message that I would like to share with all of you. Thank you. Conclude tonight with remarks. We'll conclude tonight with remarks from uh, from John Henry Crosby. Thank you, Duncan, and thank you, Lily, for beautiful and inspiring remarks. It seems somehow unfair to have to follow this. So I suppose the best way to introduce myself is as the spiritual grandson of Alice von Hildebrand, or Lily von Hildebrand as we know her. Whereas most of us have two grandmothers, I've been extremely lucky to have three. And that's saying a great deal because I had two wonderful grandmothers. I remember being very proud when Lily decided it was time to give me a nickname. I told her that my immediate family when I was a child called me Johnny, and she immediately adopted calling me Johnny. Now you need to know that Dietrich, as some of you know, had a nickname that he had since childhood. To his friends and family, he was Gogo. In any case, one day, Lily told me that I had certain traits that reminded me of Gogo, and so she proposed that my nickname should be Johnny Go. <laughs> I still re remember a few moments of true innocent pride of basking in the glory of such an exalted company, but this proved to be short-lived. She said, Gogo was the most extraordinary personality I ever met. But he had certain weaknesses. For example, he could be impulsive, just like you. <laughs> so much for Johnny Go. Or maybe not. It turns out that through the hundreds, even thousands of emails that we've exchanged, I've been Johnny Go. So the name has stuck. And more importantly, the adoption has become fully realized. So it is as a spiritual grandson that I want to reflect with you for a moment on our beloved Lily von Hildebrand. What is her secret? What allowed this little Belgian lady who came to the USA as a refugee from the Nazi invasion to become everything we hold so dear? We have with us today many of her former students from Hunter College, not only Stephanie Block, but a whole group of, of those of you who experienced her as a teacher, many of her dear friends, and a, a room full of admirers. We've all experienced her gifts. There's a beautiful idea that I think many of you have heard Lily quote from her husband. When he was praised for an insight, Dietrich would say, but remember, the truth, insofar as I have seen it, comes not from me, but through me. If this seems simple or obvious, and I'll admit occasionally it seemed that way to me, uh, then perhaps we lack some self-knowledge. Now, Lily has fully absorbed the depth of those words. How many times have many of us said to her, oh, yes, yes, I agree with you, only for her to stop, sometimes in somewhat inconvenient places, like in the middle of boarding a plane, for her to say, dear one, do not agree with me, agree with the truth. So we've had, we've had many a traffic jam and serious moment of advice along the way. She also doesn't like it when I say, right, right, right. So <laughs> she must know that I'm not paying enough attention. But I think that this particular way of approaching truth is a part of Lily's secret. Consider that many of her students enter the classroom broken, confused and closed to any kind of transcendent message, how did she win them over? I would submit that Lily gradually won them over 
by a sort of special mixture of ardor and objectivity. What do I mean by that? I mean that her students realized very quickly that she was not wedded to ideas because they were her own, but because she was convinced of their truth. And it was for this reason that she was passionate. Lily Best summarizes this approach in something else that I love very much and that we've perhaps all heard her say when she says that truth is not mine or yours, but ours. Truth does not isolate or limit us. Rather, it brings us into communion and sets us on the path to life. To this day, I am deeply impressed by how objective and yet simultaneously how passionate Lily can be. And I think we've all experienced that. But this single-minded focus on truth is only part of the story. We all know people sincerely committed to truth who are not especially effective emissaries. What is the additional ingredient? I think it's as simple and yet as profound as love. Lily loves deeply, her students, her friends, even those who meet her fleetingly experience this love. And I've been with her on many occasions when someone comes up to her in a hotel or in an airport and confesses to having been deeply affected by her, and she encounters them with love. I know there are many reasons why she endured at Hunter, which was in many ways a great persecution for her, but I think the deepest reason she stayed for 37 years was the love for her students. I'm reminded of something. I recently heard the Italian statesman Rocco Buccellone, who many of you know, uh, say about his close friendship with John Paul II. I had the privilege, as some of you do, did with me, of spending almost a week with him uh, just last week. And Rocco said, and I'm quoting sort of more or less, he said, John Paul taught me the meaning of friendship. Friendship is when someone takes a passionate interest in you and in your concerns. A friend, and this struck me, a friend is someone who really belongs to their friends. Is this not Lily? I've always been struck by her passionate interest in her friends, their lives, their joys, their sufferings. I've rarely met someone who so deeply shares her friends' joys and heartbreaks. It's always moving for me, and, I, and I'm sure again for you, when in recounting the misfortune of one of her friends, she says, dear one, why am I so shattered? It's because she loves. In the company of the Hildebrands, and I know that Dietrich is, is here with us tonight, it is always wise to appeal to beauty, especially when it is possible to appeal to the great Beethoven, who was one of the great common loves of Dietrich and Lily. So let me conclude, perhaps with an unexpected twist here, by quoting one of Beethoven's great love songs, Zärtliche Liebe, Tender Love. And I read it with a deliberate double meaning, for it is really a love song, which captures the love of Dietrich and Lily. And yet it also captures a portion of Lily's great charisma for friendship for all of us. So it goes like this. I love you as you love me, in the evening and in the morning. Nor was there a day when you and I did not share our troubles. And when we shared them, they became easier to bear. You comforted me in my distress, and I wept in your laments. Therefore, may God's blessing be upon you, you my life's joy. God protect you, keep you for me, and protect us and keep us both. So thank you very much. So this has been a unique event where many old friends have met with uh, many new friends. I hope that in the coming months, we can make clear to you the, the mission and the ambitions of the Dietrich von Hildebrand Legacy Project um, and welcome you back to future celebrations. Uh, for any of you who would like to continue the conversation, uh, there is a little patch of uh, paradise to be colonized at the Algonquin down the street. Go out the door of the Yacht Club and hook her, go to port. Uh, I have to think about that, but turn right. Starboard, uh, starboard thank you. And uh, uh, go, and we have some space reserved there under under the name Hildebrand, um, Dr. von Hildebrand, Alice, happy birthday, Your Eminence. Thank you so much for joining us. All distinguished guests, all guests. Period. All friends. We are all friends now. Thank you for coming. Good night. <laughs>